Right, ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Welcome to Real Estate Investor Talk. It's our weekly thought leadership webinar brought to you by Remag. And we're hosting these webinars, the thought leadership webinars, every Friday between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. And uh, this week, uh, we are going to discuss specifically uh, a topic which everybody's asking questions about how business and real estate can navigate the current economy, learn from past recessions to navigate the economy after lockdown and COVID-19. And uh, just, just before we begin, for those of you who have just come on now, I just want to give you a little bit of house rules. Uh, if you've got any technical issues, please go into the chat box, which is uh, the second box on the bottom. Um, if you've got any questions, please send your questions through. Give us your name and where you're from. It'll be also nice to know exactly where you're from. And you just drop that into the Q&A box and we will pose those questions to the panelists. And uh, so I would like to introduce our esteemed panel. And I think we've really got a great combination here. And um, I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves first. Quick two minutes. Um, so I'm going to start off with Dr. Rula Bhutta. Uh, so Dr. Bhutta, if you can maybe just start off uh, with your introduction. Certainly, guys. Um, <clears throat> my name is Dr. Rula Bhutta. I'm the economic advisor to the Optimum uh, Investment Group. We've got about uh, 7 billion on in uh, assets under management. And with all the usual stuff, short term, long term insurance, I write a monthly column for them on the topic of macroeconomic issues. Uh, any viewer that's interested in receiving that, you can either send your email to Neil or uh, contact their website, um, Optimum Investment Group. I'm also the uh, author of a publication called The Bright Side, which uh, incorporates Currency Compass, published by Currencies Direct, and an advisor to, to them. Um, to uh, Graham Barrett and, and uh, Otto Schoen and, and their crowd. Um, they're also sponsoring, to, to some extent, my participation here today and the econometric analysis of mortgage loans, which you'll see shortly. Uh, if you're interested in receiving uh, the bright side, it's, it's a document designed to just look at a bit of good, good news and make cynics weep. We say that also in the intro. Uh, you're also welcome to uh, uh, Eight Currencies Direct uh, website. And uh, you can see that on a regular basis. The currency compass, which is incorporated, gives you on a monthly basis, tells you what the real value of the rand is and the extent of its um, undervaluation or overvaluation. It has been overvalued several times. And I've got that slide a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rolof. And Evan, I think over to you. Very warm welcome to you this morning. If you could introduce yourself to the audience. Yes, uh, my name is Erwin Rode. We are uh, property economists and property valuers and property consultants. Uh, we are probably best known uh, for the Rode Report, which is one of our three publications. Uh, the, the report summarizes uh, and surveys the property market in all its uh, major cities in South Africa every quarter. And then we interpret the data, decide the data, and publish our. Um, our interpretation of the data. We also do forecasts, uh, six-year forecasts for, for serious professional um, uh, property owners uh, who need to, uh, um, can use it as um, uh, for viability study. Right, uh, as consultants, we could, it covers a very wide field. Anything that's got vaguely something to do with property, we tend to be asked to help. Um, most of the time, you'll find the consultancy nowadays in South Africa so you become part of a team, um, uh, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, yeah, and then we uh, we are the biggest um, unknown in this world is that so that Roder and Associates are also uh, formidable valuers. We've got about five uh, professional valuers, and we work countrywide uh, property valuations. Great stuff. That's Thank it. Thank you, Erwin. Okay, Wayne, um, if you could introduce yourself to the uh, audience, please. Hi, my name is Wayne van der Fent. I, for many years, I was head of properties at the Public Investment Corporation and took that skill set of purchasing property and managing property and now run a property business that focuses on developing software 
and tech in the property industry, specifically around the transactional end of rentals and sales. So we find this to be a very appropriate time because obviously where one was unable to do, where one is unable to do things physically, the, the, the space of technology is now becoming probably a lot more interesting and needed for people where, where previously it was something as a nice add-on. Technology is probably going to become more and more of a need in terms of, of, of our sustainability in the, in the property space. So, so Coin Online builds, builds platforms and we do a lot of work for, for the listeds and we do a lot of work for, for the banking sector where we offer our services um, in respect of the software development. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Wayne. And Kuli, wonderful to actually have you on board. Uh, please introduce yourself. I mean, you've got quite an esteemed background. Tell us about it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me on board, uh, Neil. My name is Nkuli Bukhupa. I am the MD for Real Estate Investor Services at Brawl Property Group. Uh, Brawl being a Pan-African uh, real estate management company. We offer a number of uh, services across the value chain of real estate, but the main uh, entities within our, our group is real estate investor services. We've got occupier services as well as the facilities management business. Uh, and then we also have research uh, auctions business. We have valuations, broking and leasing as well. I am here representing uh, my division, which I'm the, the MD for, and we actually have 115 rands uh, 115 billion rands worth of assets under our management uh, with various listed funds that we manage for and um, that's just in the south african context that i'm speaking about um, i'm also the vice president of the black business council and um, was past president of the south african institute of black property practitioners so yeah i've been in the industry for a number of years I joined Brawl just over two years ago, and um, it's fun and games. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Kuli. Okay, and last but not least, we've got uh, Simon. We've got an attorney in the house. Please uh, introduce yourself, Simon. <laughs> Thanks very much, Neil. It's uh, Simon de Pinar here. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm representing my own law firm based in Cape Town. We also have a small branch in Johannesburg. The name of the firm is uh, traditionally named after the director, Simon de Pinar and Associates. And uh, essentially, we have a department that specializes in property law, specifically evictions, as they affect landlords and tenants. The motto of the firm is uh, respect, recognition, and ethical responsibility. And we try and have those values shine through in the advice and representation we give to both landlords and tenants. Obviously, we are living in very interesting times in that the whole legal landscape has somewhat changed overnight and it's being developed as we speak. And I look forward to contributing some insights as far as I can understand them uh, regarding the national disaster state we now face. Wonderful, thank you very much, Simon. Okay, so let's get into the subject at hand, uh, ladies and, and gents, and uh, let's talk about you know, what we can learn from past recessions, because uh, I think we're in a very unusual situation. We're in day 50 of lockdown level four, and there's talk about easing of, uh, of uh, the restrictions from the beginning of June. And if we look at what's been happening on Google, people have been Googling recession. I think it's up by 525%. 64% of people are concerned about long-term negative impact from the crisis. And um, we've seen businesses closing their doors. We've seen retrenchments. We've seen turnover has dropped. And a lot of staff have been laid off. Uh, residential sales have dropped by an estimated uh, 60 odd percent. Um, we've seen rentals struggle, particularly in the um, residential sector, and figures are north of 20 percent. And uh, and then, of course, in the commercial side of things, um, I think it's a, a lot bigger. I've heard numbers of 50 percent, which we're going to discuss now. Banks are offering payment holidays. There's uh, a rise in, in, in insolvencies, anticipated unemployment, and it's not looking good. We are in a recession. So I'm going to ask Dr. Rula Buerta to maybe just set the scene and tell us a little bit about uh, what is actually going on there. 
So over to you, um, Rudolf. Right. Um, and Rudolf has got a, a presentation he's going to share. He's the only one who's going to share some wonderful slides. We can see. We just need your full set slide there, Rudolf. Thank you. Great. Right. Can everybody see the slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on the negative stuff because I think Neil has given us a very nice, <laughs> concise overview. Uh, let's face it, we're in trouble, but the whole world is in trouble. So I'm going to try to maybe get the, the viewers and ourselves to think beyond COVID-19 or the worst of it at least, and that may be within the next couple of months. Uh, and my first slide is, is uh, you know, to those of you that almost got a heart attack when you saw your uh, life savings, if it's uh, on the JSE adrenal, um, that's recovered uh, magnificently. Not quite as good as the Dow Jones. And just an interesting point, NASDAQ is doing fantastically well in these days. As Wayne mentioned, you know, this is uh, the fourth industrial revolution is now going to get a jump start uh, in, in the behind. There were prophets of doom that were telling us that uh, this is the end. Look where our bond yield is. It's, it's heading for way out of control. Uh, at the time, in uh, I believe in one of my publications, uh, The Bright Side, uh, I predicted that it's just a question of weeks before uh, the bond yield comes down again. And this was such an easy one to call. Uh, if you look at the next one, our bond yields are so attractive, uh, even after they dip now be, uh, below 10%. We should be in line with our peers, Brazil, India, Russia, and, um, and China. And in fact, fund managers around the globe are going to make a killing uh, buying South African uh, uh, bonds. So that's good news. That means lower debt costs for government uh, as we look into the future. This is um, the latest uh, currency direct rear slide, the real effect of exchange rate. The rand's undervaluation at the end of April was 22%. It has been overvalued of the red line uh, on several occasions. And once again, it is just a question of time, probably months before this blue line starts heading towards the red line. And that's the long-term average. That's where it wants to be. Um, there they had been a growing gap between the real prime rate and the PDP growth rate. Um, I'm on record for criticizing the Reserve Bank over the last couple of years for their uh, weird uh, obsession with, with state monetary policy when there was clearly a demand efficiency in our economy. And that gap is now going to start closing at a rapid rate of knots. I see in this morning's paper for the Afrikaans viewers, if you've got out of the this morning, you'll see my opinions on the lockdown on the main editorial page my two weekly column, but um, there is speculation that we are next week going to have another 100 basis points decline. That is fantastic news for the economy, not good news for people with money in the money market right now. And as a result of slow growth, sluggish growth and high interest rates, what has happened, of course, is that household disposable income has been under pressure in real terms, absolutely flat. But that's not only because of interest rates, it's also because of a lot of uncertainty, and it's the legacy of the Zuma era which was, in Trevor Manuel's words, the biggest disaster ever to hit our country. But Zuma apparently thinks it's young from Libya, but I must differ from him on that one. Um, this should start picking up from next year onwards. Um, property is expensive. Let's, let's be quite honest about that. So I, I've been looking for some parallels. Now, uh, vehicles are also expensive. I know people whose vehicles cost more than their properties, the houses they live in. <laughs> I think you two, uh, some of our viewers may uh, feel guilty about this. I'm not sure if you add all your vehicles together. So, and there is a very predictable, long-standing, positive correlation between durable goods, new vehicles is one of them, probably the most durable that you can find, and GDP growth. So as GDP growth goes down, just a matter of time, we cling onto our old cars a little bit longer, um, and vice versa, and this continues. And this is relevant to the property market, because if you ever wanted to know what an inverse correlation is, yeah, you've got it. Uh, as the prime rate increases, as the cost of financing a vehicle, the cost of financing a house increases, uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that uh, people will buy fewer uh, vehicles. I've been trying to tell this to the Reserve Bank for quite some while. They remind me of the definition of a statistician, who is a person that will tell you if your feet are in the oven and your head is in the freezer, you are quite comfortable. Uh, but please don't try that. Uh, and, and this is 
um, the result of an economic exercise which was conducted by Prof. Ilse Boeta from UJ. Uh, no nepotism here, she was uh, from Rensburg 28 years ago, best student I ever had. Today she's an internationally acclaimed econometrician. Maar so soon Afrikaans says that Rach getrouw. And I said to me to Boeta getrouw. Well done, Ilse. <laughs> and uh, so what we see here is th the red line is the actual GDP that we've experienced uh, at the 5.3% average real prime rate. That was the average after John Marcus left, best governor we ever had. I asked you that to, to, uh, I asked her to des design model and I assisted with that. The model, we asked the model, what would our GDP have been if the real prime rate, prime minus CPI had stayed at 3% as it was during John Marcus' tenure? And that gap is more than half a trillion rand. That is more than 10% of our GDP. And this is so crucial to our discussion today because interest rates are coming down and they're going, probably going to stay there for quite some time. And there are going to be huge effects, side effects from that after COVID, once our economy gets back to, to steam and once we start uh, picking up again. And that's what I'd like to do here. And I'm just about finished, is for us to reflect a little bit on the future. So if you look at the latest available growth forecasts by uh, you know, an array of, of groups, of this tech, BNP Paribas, Optimum uh, uh, Investment Group, etc. Uh, they're shocking, they're terrible. Uh, some of them are talking about 10% decline this year, so that's it. But look at the green box. Um, there, there's a profound uh, optimism about next year, about a rebound as we play catch up. And as new industries and new sectors will start developing and flourishing from this, uh, from this event and from changing behaviors. Passenger aircraft are being transformed into freight aircraft. That's just one of dozens of examples of new industries. And here's the, um, my second last slide, mortgage advances in real terms uh, and the prime rate in real terms, end of quarter data. And you can clearly see here what happens to, what happened to mortgage bonds as, 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 as the, um, uh, the prime rate declined, uh, mortgage bonds, the value of outstanding mortgage bonds in real terms increased. I think we all remember this era when house prices just kept on climbing. The F and B house price index was increasing at a rate of 35 percent year on year, uh, and then then we would have expected with this lowering of the prime rate during the John Marcus era for the mortgages to recover, but they didn't because there was a huge hangover from the property boom. Too many yuppies were buying two, three, four properties and renting them out, and they burnt their fingers when the interest rate started increasing in that period. And then of course we had the, the Zuma era which, which uh, and the high interest rates. And here we had a little bit of a, an uptick after Ramaphosa was elected president. And hopefully he'll, um, he'll take over as president again <laughs> in the next couple of months because right now one is not sure what's going on right now. Uh, and then my last slide and uh, the cherry on top of this cake. Uh, this research was uh, sponsored by Currencies Direct. In the last couple of days, we've been working around the clock with our econometric model. And we asked the model to tell us what uh, is likely to happen. And this model does not take consideration of COVID-19. This is ex-COVID. So if there had not been a COVID, what would have happened to the, uh, mo the total value of mortgage, outstanding mortgage advances in real terms um, over the next eight quarters at the same real interest rates uh, that existed in the beginning of this year, which was 6%, just over 6%. And what would happen, that's the blue line, if under the current interest rate scenario, the real prime rate now is 3.7, and it's going to go to 2.7, and probably because of low inflation, 2.3, 2.4, within the next couple of months. So, and you can see that gap, that is really fantastic news. And this is what I like, I'd like us to, to, to re try to remember is that with a bit of luck, we are looking at a sustained period of much lower mortgage financing costs as we move into the future. I hope I'm correct on that one, but I'm very bullish about 2021. 2020, not so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Rudolf. Evan, do you agree with Rudolf? He's, yeah, that was very positive. I mean, uh, do you, how are we going to get ourselves out of this after lockdown? Is it going to be back to normal, Evan? Is it going to be back to normal? Can you maybe just uh, give us your views there? Well, I think one should consider both short and, uh, and long-term uh, drivers of, of growth. The first long-term driver or medium-term driver that worries me 
is the question of, of ESCOM. Um, I can't see how you can have growth in the economy when ESCOM puts a, a cap on, on growth. Um, I mean, the moment growth starts uh, accelerating, uh, ESCOM is going to push the head down under the water again. Um, and I don't see uh, green electricity catching up with this uh, problem anytime soon. The bureaucracy is just too terrible for that to happen overnight. But eventually, yes, we will get there, but it's going to take many, many years. Um, so uh, that's the easy one. I, I keep on saying that it's never been as easy as now to make uh, medium term forecasts. By medium, by medium term, I mean from a property point of view, to me, medium is five years. <laughs> um, I know. Uh, Financial analysts have a diff different definition of medium term. Uh, the other, on the shorter term, uh, you know what worries me about uh, uh, much lower interest rates is that our uh, and the ruler will know better than I do what percentage of GDP is made up of, uh, of consumption in this country and also big parts of the Western world. It's a very high percentage. The law is at 60%, 70%, whatever it is. It's, Maybe 65 percent, it's very high. So, yes, you will stimulate uh, uh, the economy, but you'll stimulate it through consumption. By, um, and uh, my question is, what is the effect of that on the longer term uh, economy if we have keep on stimulating uh, consumption, whereas as a developing country, we actually need investment, not consumption so much. So uh, we can learn a lot from the Chinese uh, in that respect and the Asian tigers uh, in general. Um, as for the property to, to, to get uh, closer to home, um, I'm afraid this is a horror story. Uh, I could just imagine how many of the line shop owners, the pop and mom owners of properties, how many of them will go underwater um, and uh, how easy So uh, I think shopping center owners are going to suffer the most and they'll be faced with terrible uh, moral and also uh, legal uh, problems. Uh, they'll have to negotiate and compromise with their tenants because no use trying to extract money from tenants who don't have the money. And uh, so my advice would be to landlords is the very first thing you should do is decide whether you want to keep this tenant yes or no. Easy and uh, a good add to your um, to your mix of, uh, of, of of line shops. Um, if you want to keep this guy, uh, he's been a good uh, payer in the past, uh, or good standing. If you want to keep him, obviously you'll have to negotiate with him and um, take the medium to long term view rather than the very short term view. Of course, in cases with the landlord, it's not landlord with deep pockets but has got a high mortgage bond on his or her uh, uh, shopping center especially shopping centers uh, you've got a serious problem because the landlord's also very 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 dependent on the on cash flow as is if anybody else so I'm afraid uh, in the few cases in South Africa where private there are private owners uh, of uh, highly geared uh, shopping centers uh, these guys face a terrible dilemma and I obviously don't have an answer to that, and I don't think anybody uh, has got an answer to that problem. Um, as for uh, houses, most people are interested in houses because, as we all know, that's our biggest investment as individuals. Um, the worst decline we've seen in the past in the recessions in South Africa in house prices was about 10% in nominal terms. Um, and that lasted then for only a very short period. And please note, we've had some terrible recessions for those of you who are only 25 years of age. Uh, believe you me, we've had some terrible ones. Um, now, uh, I, I'm afraid this one's gonna be worse than the terrible ones. Um, uh, because don't forget that when we entered the COVID uh, uh, era, we were already in a second technical recession. And I'm now in the, area of, uh, of and I'm, I'm sure he, I would like to hear his comments on it but the point is that the, the, there was a reason why we were in the recession he would say it was high interest rate. 
but uh, I would argue it's more fundamental. Um, uh, South Africa has got a serious, but a serious structural problems. Uh, and uh, the biggest problem we face, and that is not something you read in the newspapers, uh, but uh, it's nevertheless the most serious of all problems because it's a long-term problem and it's a problem you can do nothing about. And that problem's name is democracy. We've got too many people in a country with too few taxpayers and too few entrepreneurs. It's as simple as that, I'm afraid. And uh, that's not, there's no, if I were the government today, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to tackle it. The Chinese, uh, as we all know, they had a policy for a long time of one child per family. You can't do that in a democracy. And in any event, if, even if you were to introduce that, it's going to take a generation or two before right. it affects uh, the growth. Thanks, Evan. Look, is it all doom and gloom, Wang? I mean, is it, I mean, now we've got two. We've got negative, we've got positive. We've got interest yeah. and, uh, and Rulof said it's going to come down by another percent. I mean, is it what Erwin says or Erwin says, or is it as, as Rulof says? Can you maybe just elaborate a little bit going forward? Because you in the commercial sector, what is your view there, Wang? Probably, probably in the middle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I do know is... Uh, what I do know is I'm not going to ask Erwin to value my properties next week without outlook. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I think the point is well made that firstly, property is driven by how the business sector does. We, we are not necessarily market makers. We, we, if, if retail doesn't go back soon, we will see greater failures in the retail space. It, it's not about, whether people can open, but whether they will be around to open. If stores can open, people will go. I don't, I don't buy completely into the logic that says people will only do their shopping online. They will go back and shop. My daughter buys her shoes online, but she's champing at the bit to go out and participate in the shop. You know, shopping is experiential. It's not just about buying it online. The question is more how many of the retailers are going to be able to open their businesses at a point in time. Some businesses have had the inevitable happen. So with Edcon, I think COVID-19 just made what was going to happen, happen sooner. I think in these instances, um, capitalism also does require bankruptcy, I think is what Sam Zeller says. And what bankruptcy does is it clears the decks and puts others in place. And so on the one hand, we're going to see some businesses that have failed and have failed. And that is a function both of COVID-19 and sometimes just an acceleration of time, but other businesses coming into the space. And so I think it's about how long we are going to be stuck in this COVID-19 space, how, how long it's going to take for a vaccine to come out. Different businesses are going to come back on stream faster than others. Hospitality is probably going to be the last one to come back on stream because people are going to travel with difficulty, even though the lockdowns may change. And, and so will a, a chain be able to afford to open up if it takes them 12 months before they get back to some level of, of occupancy that, that, that makes sense. And so I think therein lies the rub. But I, and so different sectors of the property industry will probably recover differently. Logistics and distribution, they, they should be doing pretty okay. If you're in that space, the logistics element, the distribution element is going to be what is where people are shopping through at the moment. But we're also going to have, we're going to see businesses focus differently on how they do business. Um, restaurants that never sold takeaways are now going to be selling their food as takeaways, possibly to, to start with. And so I think, I don't think it's going to be the V-shaped recovery that everybody anticipated and, and hoped for. I, but I don't also think it's going to be total doom and gloom. The difference being that my frame of reference is shot, of course. I've been in the property industry 30, 30 years, and unfortunately, none of that 30 years helps me in terms of being able to predict what is going on now, because never in the time I've been in property, and I've been in a few state of emergencies in the past, but none of them have been of a, of a nature where 
everything ground to a halt, where everybody was 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 staying at home, where where the whole economy, where the whole world, mm. effectively ground to a halt. We've never seen that, and and yeah. most of our recessions have been financial recessions. Yeah, this recession is is almost a medical based recession, and 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 part of the recovery is going to be based on if a vaccine is found tomorrow, the recovery. <laughs> vaccine takes a year or two the recovery is going to be a lot longer yeah. thank you and that's that's excellent I, I heard a comment from Brian Chesky the founder of Airbnb he actually predicts that future travel will be more based on leisure so there's going to be far less business travel that's what the expectation is that's what they're budgeting for going forward very interesting concept, but it's over to Nkuli. Nkuli, what do you think? What is your view? You in that commercial, you dealing with commercial tenants, with bro, yeah. you found Africa. Are you also as negative or what is your view? Are we going to get out of this? Can we get out of this? How do we get out of this? Uh, we have to get out of this. Uh, it's just a matter of time. I think for me, I've seen a positive trend in the sense that in the retail sector, already there is a 20% improvement in terms of what, we are, what we've been able to bring in as rental income. And uh, it is an improvement from last month, which was total shutdown uh, with, with respect to you know, not being able to have other retailers, but just the essential services uh, sector. So we've seen that improvement, however, Going forward, I think uh, many of our moms and pubs are really going to struggle and it's safe to work on an assumption that we will start to see at least a 20% decline in our retail sector in terms of the rental income. And therefore, if you already start to exclude uh, the adcon income um, and do your assumption based on your exposure, already that accounts for a lot, you know? Um, and if the size and the likes of an adcon is not going to make if you can just imagine how much more of the smaller retailers are going to struggle so uh, moving forward i think that's what it's going to be and we just need to prepare ourselves in, as landlords to say what are going to be the different strategies and how are we going to to see retail centers into the future and creating more of those experiences um, and, and experiential retailers being coming on board. But what I have learned in this time is that real estate is still an absolute necessity and a very good investment for one to still have in your portfolio. Um, and I say that because it was, it, it, it's shown itself across various sectors that the shutdown of not being able to come into your building or especially in the retail sector, let me put it that way, um, you don't have an income, you know? So while online shopping was great, uh, you don't have the same amount of trading density as you will have with bricks and mortar. So there, there's definitely hope. Um, and I am very optimistic about the future if we have a government that will have the political will to create an enabling environment in which SMMEs can thrive because big conglomerates cannot absorb everyone. We need to create enabling environments for businesses to be able to thrive and turn themselves around. But then again, uh, it is going to be on the businesses to also become more adaptable and agile in their solutioning. I think COVID, if there's anything positive that's come out of it, is that it's plunged us into the 4IR. We've been talking about it at conferences and just never really bold enough to go straight into it. And now it has shown itself up and we've had to turn around and adapt as quickly as possible. Now, what does concern me a little bit outside of, of you know, real estate is the agility we have, we have been shot off in terms of our education sector where those who don't have the relevant infrastructure because our economy is so uh, you know, uninclusive or non-inclusive that we can see now um, a lot of school children who are lagging behind in their education because they don't have access to the Wi-Fi that is needed or data that is needed. So those are some of the interventions that I think our government needs to focus on very quickly identifying key focal areas, infrastructure being one of them, lay the necessary infrastructure for businesses to be able 
to thrive and businesses will solution for themselves. They will come up with, with plans and um, yeah. So for now I'm hopeful because there's also been a very collaborative manner in which business and government have worked together in response to this pandemic. And that is very positive. I think if we stick with that moving forward, we can actually turn ourselves around a lot quicker than what many might foresee. Wonderful, thanks and great. And um, it's wonderful to see there is a lot of positivity despite that we're sitting in over there. Interesting, I heard yesterday, Paul O'Sullivan, he's a prosecutor, he's heavily invested in property in South Africa and he's from the UK. So he says in the longer term, so there are people that see it differently and it's normally the contrarian view of the people that are successful. But we're on to Simon. Now, Simon, you are in the face of all, probably you've probably inundated with people saying, now come pay my rent. You know, all the tenants, because you, you're in that residential space, aren't you? I mean, people say, how do I get rid of my tenant? How can I demand rent? You know, what is going on? And, and, and what kind of procedures can you follow now? I mean, between we've been on level five, level four, level three. And, you know, depending, of course, where you get the stats. I mean, I've heard stats of 20% down in terms of residential rental. I've heard 30%, depending, of course, where you get the sources from. Pay prop has 110,000 properties. They're down 20. Uh, TPN says they're, round, they're down about 30%. And uh, FNB, I think it's uh, there's various other uh, diff different versions. What, what is your view on that? What's happening out there? Okay. Thanks, Neil. Look, uh, from a legal perspective, perspective, this uh, whole lockdown situation has changed the entire legal landscape. You know, we're supposed to be living in a constitutional democracy, but now it's a national state of disaster. And a property owner in a normal legal setup has a, what is called a real right, a real right to property ownership. And he can delegate that real right to a tenant. And that tenant almost gets what is called a limited real right. Both are to use and enjoy the property. And given the change of the legal landscape and the institution of the, the lockdown regulations, essentially, we, we've moved from a real time to almost an unreal time where rights almost aren't that real anymore. So the problem is that property owners want to use and enjoy their property. Tenants also want to do it under limited circumstances, but they just simply can't. And the result of the lockdown has been that tenants can't fulfill their obligations in terms of the lease agreements. And landlords and property owners want to enforce those obligations because they simply do need to get paid because there are knock-on effects on their ability to afford, let's say, the mortgage or the bonds over the property. So it's a real catch-22 in that the, the parties uh, to the lease just simply can't perform because of the COVID-19 virus, which a lot of people are trying to interpret as an act of God, almost like a supervening impossibility, something that has happened totally beyond anybody's control or intention that's preventing them from being able to perform their legal obligations in terms of contracts. Contracts are supposed to create certainty, and we're just in such uncertain times. So the government's doing their best to um, pursue sort of a hierarchy of needs in terms of they're trying to save people's lives. They're trying to prevent the spread of virus. And they're putting together certain rules and regulations to try and achieve that purpose with the information that they have at, at, at hand in the moment from all the experts, I guess, they are being advised by. And I wouldn't want to be in that position because that really is... Um, extremely important and delicate executive decisions and administrative decisions, as we would say in law, that, uh, that need to fit uh, the, the problem, need to resolve the problem. But you know, those decisions have to be rational, they have to be reasonable, and they have to be, a, for lack of a, a proper legal term, I guess, a law of general application. And there's been a lot of criticism on government about that. But just back to landlords and tenants, essentially the process that a, a landlord would need to follow in order to hold a tenant accountable. Um, normally, uh, a tenant, if he doesn't pay, he's in breach of the agreement. But under these circumstances, because of what I've just said, a landlord needs to be more open-minded than usual. They need to be a little more lenient and compassionate, actually a lot more lenient and compassionate towards the tenant. And there's been a call from most expert, experts to have both parties sit around the proverbial table and rather just discuss what do they need, what can they afford, and enter into some kind of settlement agreement 
Now, there's always been a call for lawyers to enter into mediation before going to court or before litigating. And that applies more so now than ever before. We need legal advisors and legal representatives to adopt an emotionally intelligent approach, not, not to not overly value laden per se, but essentially there are some important values that they need to try and um, adhere to in the resolution of this, of this legal predicament. Otherwise, it's, it's just going to, to increase the acrimony and the negativity, the stress, the anxiety that exists between the, the two parties of a lease arrangement right now. So the word is Ubuntu. That's sort of the, the flavor of, of the last month or two. And I would say a commercial Ubuntu needs to be achieved between a landlord and a tenant. So my advice is landlords, be patient. Ask the tenants, what can you afford? Please disclose your income. Let's do a qualification assessments um, uh, practice of sorts. And let's see what uh, you can afford. Let's see if we can give you a payment holiday. Let's see if we can reduce the rent. But let's see if you qualify for that. So there will be plenty of tenants that maybe were nightmare tenants before the lockdown taking chances. And they might, might now want to ride on the wave of the COVID-19 excuse. And that shouldn't be allowed. Let me just say straight, the, the regulations don't allow a tenant not to pay. They have to still try somehow to pay, whether it's from their savings or whatever they, they, they can do to be resourceful under these circumstances. And the point is, a tenant is using and enjoying property, especially residential, maybe not so commercial if they're not allowed to run business. But if you are in a residence and you're forced to be there, you are making 100% use and enjoyment of that premises. And it wouldn't be fair, I think, uh, to, to not pay as much as you can uh, for that full use and enjoyment of that property. Commercial is slightly different. If, you, if your business isn't a essential service and you're not using your office at all, and let's say the, the commercial tenant isn't able to make an income remotely, then I think more leniency needs to be granted. But landlords, lawyers, managing agents don't send out letters of demand that follow the template before COVID-19 because you will have those letters screenshotted and shared on social media and you will be named and you'll be shamed. You can't tell a tenant to leave in seven days under lockdown. You can't tell a tenant to pay in 20 business days if the CPA applies. These days don't tick or expire during lockdown. It's slightly different now in that you can relocate from one place to another uh, between the dates of the 7th of May and the 7th of June. But interprovincially, you can still relocate once off um, without there being a deadline of 7th of June. That was just announced this morning. The law is in the state of flux and it's, we could have a webinar almost every day with new material, okay? Absolutely. But essentially, yeah. you, you be, be, landlords, be careful with your eviction letters and notices. What I would recommend uh, to, uh, for both the benefit of a tenant and a landlord that are in dispute about their leases at this point is proceed with the pre-court mediation scheme or package of sorts where you spend one or two hours just uh, discussing exactly what you can do to help one another through this period and just be mindful of the fact that uh, non-performance uh, or a lack of specific performance in terms of your lease is kind of beyond the control. Um, and willpower of, of, the, of the tenant under the circumstances. Wonderful. So it's long-winded, but there we go. No, no, that's fine. Look, and I think everybody set the scene. I think it was very important for everybody to go into, to, into great depth. So thank you very much to you, the panel. What I would like to do, I want to move around to everybody now. I'm going to, I'm going to give you various questions because we've got loads of questions flying in. And I think it's important that we deal with this. And we'll even, we've, we've allowed for a little bit of time for overrun to deal with them. And, uh, and I would like anybody in the panel who, who feels that they've got a view on it, I'd like you to keep it probably a little bit shorter, two minutes, you know, discussion point on that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Rulof to kick off this one. Uh, do you not think that there has been a total overreaction in the manner in which the government has dealt with this whole COVID-19 and lockdown? If you look at the stats, there's over 12,000 cases, but 45% have recovered. Uh, we don't wish to minimize the impact of death, but 238 deaths in the greater scheme of things is not much of all. The real question then is, why the overreaction? Do you want to have a go at that, Rulof? Yes, certainly. Um, 
I've done a quick cal calculation uh, for every one COVID death we've had so far in South Africa, and it's tragic, obviously. Uh, there are, uh, last year there have been 1,000, 1,000 deaths of other vi uh, viruses. Uh, so yes, absolutely, there was an overreaction. I think we should have followed the Swedish model, quite frankly, because, um, and, and, and trusted people that can what, actually... Maybe just tell us, just for the audience's benefit, what are the Swedes doing that we're not doing or could learn from? <laughs> well, the Swedes did not um, enforce the social distancing. They did it voluntarily. Uh, quite frankly, people are smart enough. Uh, most people want to live. And if you think you're going to die, if you don't wear a mask, then wear a mask. I mean, it's, it's not that difficult to understand. Certainly, there are areas in South Africa, we're all aware of that. We, we have um, an estimated 3 million illegal Zimbabweans in this country. Uh, and probably another minimum of, of between 2 and 3 million from other countries in Africa. So, uh, they are very, there are a lot of poor communities in South Africa. And, and this country is, is not unique as far as that's concerned. There's poverty in every country in the world. One should look at abject poverty and how to deal with that in the longer term. But uh, getting back to the overreaction, um, to shut down the economy uh, has really not been a terribly good idea. Uh, I, I see, and, and Julie, uh, Julie has, has answered one of the, uh, in the chat box, saying there could be a 40% de uh, increase or unemployment could go to 40%. That's entirely possible, but it's a temporary rise. Government uh, is spending 10% of our GDP on social assistance and implementing something which I've been lobbying for many years, and that's a basic income growth. Why the hell do you pay people uh, money to have, why do you pay young girls money to, to have children? I mean, that's essentially what the child support grant is all about, and I must, uh, and, I, and I agree with Irvin as far as that concerned, it's a huge problem. Give people money because they don't have money. Uh, basic income grant has, has been applied in Brazil, uh, and, ex and this is not the dole in the UK, this is just an abject poverty relief uh, mechanism would be a hell of a lot better idea if they could subsume the child support grant with it. Getting back to the overreaction. Well, if, unless government builds a bridge between um, level four and level three very quickly, and then very quickly to level two, uh, we are really in, in, in a spot of bother. Uh, and I must say, Erwin, uh, you say things are terrible, but then you also use the expression worse than terrible. <laughs> now, right now, I think we all feel like that. But we have to start thinking about two, three, four months ahead. We are faced with lower interest rates. You know, my son has a bond in his house. He's paying 10,000 Rand a month. He's got 2,000 Rand a month more in his pocket. He's going to spend that money. You know, so quite frankly, I think we need to have a balance and a balanced perspective. High population, population growth rate is not bad from a macroeconomic perspective. Who's the most populous country in the world? It's China, right? It's the second largest economy with the highest average growth rate for the last 25 years. So yes, certainly we need to build infrastructure. We need to get the RDP housing project going again. But the gap between the cost per square meter of building any, any, any um, uh, house or, or building today and, and the market value is of such a nature that I cannot agree with a, a scenario where you think that property prices are going to decline dramatically in the next couple of months. I'm getting a between 12 and 18% dividend on my rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This is a temporary problem. I think we all need to appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to bring in Avan now, because there is a question that's been asked directly to you. And I know we can debate this, guys. So you, uh, the panelists are happy to, to jump in, but uh, we've got a lot of questions flying, flying in. Most of them has got to do with related to, obviously, investment. And there's one specifically for you, Avan, that comes through uh, from here. Are you able to make any meaningful predictions at this stage as to what will happen to cap rates across the various prop uh, property classifications, the asset classifications? Um, around the turn of the millennium, we saw cap rates in excess of 15%. Can we expect cap rates to climb or even exceed these levels during and followed COVID-19? What are your views on that, Evan? No, cap rates have never been at 15%. Um, your, your prime properties in South Africa, if it's a shopping center, a large shopping center like a so-called regional or super regional shopping center, the cap rates at one stage were as low as 7% in South Africa. Um, they have now slightly uh, risen. Um, and uh, even your, uh, your oldest uh, buildings are uh, being capitalized at less than 10%. Uh, so uh, we've never had capitalization rates as high as 15%. 
come back to the question of uh, what is the prognosis for capitalization rates? Well, there are two main drivers of capitalization rates. The one is the 10 year bond yields. And we know what, what has happened to 10 year bond yields. Yes, they've come down from the peak of I think 12%. They're now back to, I don't know exactly, maybe a little will know, probably 10% or so. Um, but it's still higher than what it was a year ago. Uh, but very important, uh, there's not a one to one relationship between long bond yields and capitalization rate. It's just one of the drivers. The other important driver is um, the expected growth in, uh, in cash flows of uh, landlords. Those are the two main drivers. If you are optimistic about the future and you see a huge boom coming, all other things being equal, you'll be prepared to pay more for the same expected cash flow in the expectation that um, the that your rental in income stream will also increase quite dramatically and therefore you are pre prepared to pay at a lower capitalization rate, uh, which means you're prepared to pay more for the, for the property. To, to sum up, yes, uh, if you are going to force me to make a forecast, uh, given my prognosis for what's happening, which is not necessarily the market's prognosis, that's also an important point, um, I think one should lift um, uh, cap rates by on average half a percentage point um, but that's a that's a thumbs up uh, our model shows that um, maybe even more but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, personally I think a half a percentage point would be uh, quite enough to cater for the, the rather poor prognosis for for cash flows over the next few years right Okay, so I think maybe, Wayne, do you want to maybe extend on that? I mean, you mentioned yeah. in particular in the industrial sector, obviously warehousing and that kind of stuff. It seemed to be a sector that's, that's growing. I mean, we saw Equitas read results come out quite recently and they've got pretty good returns and uh, they're quite upbeat for the future. And it's, you know, it's obviously linked to e-commerce and all that kind of stuff going forward. But do you want to maybe just... Uh, just uh, you know, obvi obviously... In a recession, it tends to be that industrial recovers first. But again, as I'd said earlier, this is, this is not a, a recession of the type we, we necessarily know. I, 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 I'm concerned that the time is, is almost too uncertain to be able to be making predictions. You've got, you've got owners who still seven weeks ago had a value on their property and can't necessarily see that the value has diminished significantly. By the same token, you've got value buyers who seem to think that everything should be at, at a bargain basement price. And so I think the spread at the moment is way too big to be able to almost call it. By the same token, there's been no um, sales. And so, you know, in the end, um, Owen will hopefully back me up on this, but in the end, the, the proof of the pudding in, in terms of being able to determine pricing is based on transactions and you know there, there haven't been transactions the uh, deeds office is just open and the deeds office is probably going to spend the next six months trying to catch up with the backlog of the last five weeks knowing and knowing how they operate so so the concern is that without transactions happening is there's, there's it's very difficult to call by the same token the uncertainty exists you know again if i take the hospitality market Mm. unclear as to how people will travel purely because um, we're not even sure when when certain things are going to going to open and so mm. I think in various sectors it's difficult to call but other sectors will do well you know mm. logistics and distribution mm. we still to eat we still need to dress we may not go out as much we may not do x y and z but on a consumer level there will be that however that and and I I, I don't hold a completely pessimistic view of urban, but I still also believe that the, the longer we go, the greater the risk of unemployment. And with that unemployment, obviously comes a lower demand in the consumer space. And so it's great to say that that industrial and, and, and the likes will pick up, but that is going to be a function of how, for me, it's about how long this lockdown lasts. And, and, and just to touch back on the, on the previous question, I think the lockdown was necessary. Mm -hmm. I think we not had the lockdown 
we would not have been quite as ready for a potential medical problem as we are now. I, I think the purpose of the lockdown was not to not get it, but to win some time. And, and, and I think it's very easy for us to now say there are just over 200 deaths, but we could also have been sitting at 30,000 deaths. And, yeah. and unfortunately, I'm going to move on from there. I'm just so that, you know, we're just very conscious of time. Okay. And, the the and thing for us that. now is when, the thing is now how soon the lockdown can end. Right. That I Okay. Some more practical questions on the ground in Kuli. I mean, what are the kind of things you can do to to, and what are you doing practically with tenants that uh, you know that are not paying or just cannot pay? I mean, maybe do you have some experiences that you can maybe share, particularly from you know your perspective of being part of a you know a big uh, brokerage? Yeah. Uh, sure, Neil. I think uh, in answering the first question, though, I think the, the lockdown was absolutely necessary. The transition to stage three uh, is, is, is really something that we should bring forward rather than push out as far as we can. And I think that the president was quite clear in terms of the numbers that we would have been dealing with right now, up to about 80,000 infections had we not done, gone into the interventions of lockdown. So I think it was, a, it was a responsible decision to be made when it was made. Uh, economies can be rebuilt and have been rebuilt over time, but we can't bring life back, you know? So I think with respect to the landlords and the tenants, um, landlords have taken, I mean, we've had the SA read, sit down with the SACSC and try to come up with some guidelines as to how to provide the necessary rent reliefs for the tenants. Um, some landlords have been better than others, I must say, uh, a little bit more reasonable, more understanding. I think they understand that the tenant is king and you have to absolutely protect the line shops. Um, you know, it's a pity that some of the big retailers, even though they could afford to do more, like the likes of I won't mention the essential services pharmaceutical, well, the, the one that sells pharmaceutical products that would only pay 40%, you know, of the rent while they were actually essential services and they were open from the outset. So it is going to be a balancing act of keeping reasonable with each other. It doesn't help getting legal with, with tenants uh, because the only people who are going to win are the, are the lawyers. These tenants don't have the money, they don't have it, you know. So yeah, it is about those landlords who are going to take a more reasonable, pragmatic point of view in how they engage with their tenants better into the future, who most of them have. Uh, but I've also seen the abuse of a number of landlords where tenants who are very small and don't have the, the financial muscle to out lawyers have been bullied into having to pay and letters of demand etc etc so if that trend stops i think both parties might be able to get through this a little bit sooner okay. yes so thanks so really there's a lot of it, uh, questions around investments and uh, i'm going to put it they're going to do two more questions and then obviously i'd like the panel to to wrap up and obviously we'd like to get something positive but i'm going to ask go to simon quickly because it's actually the opposite of what uh, people want to do in a time like this, advice on tenants particularly, and there's a question out there, please advise on how to get tenants, how to acquire tenants right now on residential property, because I mean, some people have got tenants, but they're not paying. So I don't know whether you've got any views on that, Simon, maybe is there a strategy? Yeah. I think people are looking some kind of advice, some kind of input there. What are your views on that? Yeah. Look, it's a, it's a difficult situation to find a good tenant to replace a bad tenant when you can't necessarily uh, very legally and ethically remove a bad tenant. So you, you're in the best position where you've got a good tenant who was someone that's always been a good tenant, but that, that has just fallen on hard times now. And my advice would be to, to try and foster the most positive, productive uh, relationship with your existing tenant. Maybe you could even turn a bad tenant into, into a good tenant somehow, depending on the, um, the adjustment of your terms of your lease agreement. But essentially, if you want to find a replacement good tenant, you're going to have to first follow some kind of procedure to get uh, to resolve the, the bad tenant problem. And in South Africa, 
you know, as much as a, as uh, was said previously, as much as a landlord may be aggressive towards tenants, what the, the viewers need to understand is that the purpose of lease law and more so eviction law is about balancing interests in a fair and equitable manner. That's really the purpose and spirit of eviction law, especially because it's respecting a constitutional right to adequate housing. Uh, my concern is that if uh, a landlord doesn't keep that in mind in his perhaps aggressive tactics in pursuing a tenant, uh, he may have to uh, take it into account or it may be forced upon him by a judge or a magistrate in the course of a uh, PI application or an eviction application. But it's, a, it's an interesting and challenging question. How does one go about sourcing a good tenant? I guess you need to be able to sell yourself as a very reasonable and fair landlord. <laughs> you have to be flexible when it comes to the leasing terms. It all boils down to money, I guess. And the, uh, the, the, the terms that allow more flexibility when it comes to use and enjoyment. So landlords need to prepare to sharpen their sales and marketing skills, as well as their negotiation skills. And they can, they can get help uh, with, with those challenges from a good um, managing agent, a good property agent, and also a good lawyer. So <laughs> if you do the right thing, I think you will generate good karma for yourself. Right. But if you find yourself in a bad situation with a bad tenant that you want to, to try and have leave the property, be very careful, be mindful of the purpose of evictions, and you've got to be strategic because right. certain things can be used against you. I'm going to give you a minute there, Wayne. I can see you want to comment. So, just very simply, I think it's going to be a function of what product you're going to offer. Now, I'm not going to go into whether people can afford this space, but if, if you've been under lockdown now and you were living in a 14 square meter flat, you probably are climbing the walls. If, and so I think you're going to find that if you're able to offer space that is safe, secure, if you're able to offer people space that has got good connectivity, they're able to work from home, if you're able to offer people space that has security, if you're able to offer people space where they're able to go outside, that will give you an edge over everybody else. I think within the residential space, for example, people are going to be a lot more driven to find a good space that I'm happy to stay in. Because if you were living in a bad space with bad water and everything not working, then these last five weeks would have been would have been pretty hellish, you know, for a lot of us who are, not, are good middle class folk, this has been like a bit of an extended holiday. But if you haven't had those elements, then, then it's been a very bad five or six weeks. Yeah. And I think we're going to see a landlord's needing to offer a better product. And, and that is going to be what is going to make the difference. And that product is not really about space. Mm. That product, the add-on services like when you go to an hotel. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. For your, we have come to the end of the webinar. What I'm going to do is ask each one of you to wrap up. I'm going to give you two minutes, and I would like to hear something positive. Let's maybe look at something going forward, you know, how, it, how we can navigate this thing after lockdown, because many of us don't actually know. Um, I mean, we're seeing industries are, are going to change. And, uh, I mean, for example, we are now, this is the way to do business. Uh, if we look at the, the travel industry, flights, you know, all that, you know, we see the airlines, they're struggling, hospitality, we've spoken about it. But I think let's maybe start off with you, Rolof. I mean, first of all, interest rates are coming down. That's positive. I mean, we, we're talking about this is in the 70s, you know, it was at such low levels. So there has been something positive that's come out of it. So, Rolof, maybe you can, uh, in conclusion, give us your concluding in terms of how we can take this thing forward. And, uh, and I'd like to ask each of the panelists, maybe from their perspective, whether it's in the real estate industry, in your business or whatever, how we can take this, or how can we navigate this going forward? Rula. Well, uh, thank you, Neil. From a macro perspective, um, things are looking terrible. I mean, the, the range, there is a 1,000 basis point difference between uh, you know, the lowest and, and the highest uh, forecast for GDP growth. Uh, this year amongst the panel of 35 economists that participate in the media 24 economists of the year um, competition uh, which, which i happen to have won by the way um with a bit of luck and uh, I, i'm putting my hope on on lower interest rates for the simple reason that capital formation and the prime rate in south africa are correlated close to 70 percent 
and it's an inverse correlation. We had the third highest foreign direct investment in our history over the last year, thanks to Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa's new commitment, um, which I don't think is being shared by all of his cabinet ministers. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is apparently the first thing that happened when Moody's downgraded us, which was discounted already, is he found the finance minister and told him, right, green light. Now we start structural reforms, as Nkuli has also alluded to. We need structural change in this country. We need to make it easier for small businesses and businesses in general. They must tell us whether property will be secure. Uh, this damn debate about uh, expropriation without compensation, uh, which is a shortcut to poverty, must end quickly and, and make it a lot easier. Our labor legislation needs to be deregulated. It is so difficult and costly uh, and such a hassle to employ people in the formal sector in this country. So all of these things wait for us. The point is just that interest rates are down, they are going to continue coming down, and this thing will pass at some point in time. China, the second largest economy in the world, the, its composite PMI has been in positive territory above 50 for two months in a row. So I'm convinced that in three, four months from now, uh, we'll be focusing on the future and not on, on this mess that we found ourselves. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you very much. A lot, Arvan? Well, my biggest concern is, and uh, really this is a question to Rulof, and I would like to him to, to, to reply to it, and this is the fiscal cliff that existed before uh, COVID-19. And, uh, and what the government is now spending on, um, on uh, social uh, relief, uh, we all know this is a, a big catastrophe from a debt point of view. And uh, do you as an economist uh, incorporate uh, the growing, growing debt and the debt trap in which we already are in your, uh, uh, in your forecast, in your medium term forecast, because this is one of the things that worries me uh, as a property uh, person, because property people don't think short term. Yes, we know we're going to have a, have a, a bounce back uh, next, next year, but from a very low base. In fact, I saw uh, a very formidable institute's forecast the other day, which shows a bounce back the next year. But that bounce back wouldn't even bring us back to where we were last year, uh, uh, GDP-wise. So um, I would love to have Rulof's uh, opinion on... Uh, on I'm going to give you one minute, Rulof, because you've, you've thrown the question around here. <laughs> I think that takes another uh, weapon off. A, a quick reply, uh, and, and then I'm finished, please. <laughs> I haven't had a cup of coffee today. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, the fiscal situation is, is, is dire, and uh, all economists are concerned about that. But uh, the point is that our public debt GDP ratio is below 60%. Um, in the case of the United States, it's exactly double that. And yes, our bond yield is higher, but our bond yield is dropping. So, quite frankly, with an IMF loan at virtually zero rate, with hardly any strings attached, and with some good financial engineering, and not giving public servants increases this year. I mean, this is ridiculous, especially not at water affairs, and especially not for those corrupt people. Sorry, I must watch my language here, and so on. But uh, our fiscal, we are not over a fiscal cliff yet, quite frankly. So um, I'm still optimistic about the future. The minute this economy starts growing and we start creating jobs again, we broaden the tax base. So let, let's look into the future if we can. Thanks. Thanks for a lot. Okay, Wayne, in closing, please. Yes, I think, I think we're going to be fine, but we're going to be different. I think we, we're going to see some things end. I think we're going to find that in the um, office sector, for example, we are going to go back to work. We can't all work from home. We will go back. It's how we use that space that's going to be different. I think landlords now need to start asking themselves, what are the changes that need to be brought about? I think it's the same comments I made about uh, residential. It's going to be about how landlords and investors in property change the product that they, the product offering. I think this has pushed us to a point where, where things that would have had taken four or five years to happen are now being compressed. I think we're going to find in, in technology, this Zoom conference, for example, would not have, if you had asked me to participate eight weeks ago, I wouldn't have been able to because I didn't have the technology. Now, now I do, and this has become my way of life. I think that's going to be the case in a lot of instances where we're going to find efficiencies being able to come about. And I, I don't, I agree with Nkuli, the property market is always going to be there. It is the shape and form that may differ. And it's going to be about how we as landlords 
and owners are going to be ready or willing to to take that you know when we want to get rid of a tenant we must remember that at the at the beginning of the year it cost you 18 months worth of lost rental for, to to put a new tenant into into a space that's probably increased now mm -hmm. so you better off sometimes trying to find methodologies to retain that tenant than to than to evict and try and put a new one in. But those are going to be mindset changes and I think paradigm changes that we as landlords are going to need to take. And I must be honest, we as, as, as South African property landlords, often we've been slow to change and, and we've been slow to, to accept. And I think yeah. possibly what this has done is forced us Excellent. to understand we need to change. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Wayne. And Kuli, in closing, please. Way forward. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Again, I would stress our government creating an enabling environment. Uh, businesses can, in many ways, solution for themselves. They just need to not have barriers and obstructions while doing that, and focus on key areas. Uh, to try and create more taxpayers. Right now, I think we've got about 16 million of them versus 17 million who are on grants. And we've increased the funds on the UIF even before COVID because we are preempting more unemployment pre-COVID. Now imagine what happens, you know? So if we have a focus on creating more taxpayers, then it makes sense. Our deeds office is quite archaic, uh, albeit the most reliable. I think they have to migrate to a digital platform of sorts, and it must be something that gets considered very seriously. Our tax uh, in income would be a lot more if our deeds office could move swiftly and be more agile. Uh, as it is, they have a backlog, and it could take you three months in any case you know, to go through one property transfer, that is a loss of income to our government. And I think we need to think very seriously about how we're going to move them along and help them turn things around because then the transactions will happen and the valuations will be more realistic once the transactions are active. Um, and then I also think that the commercial offices might, they've already started, some funds have already started with their conversions from office to residential. Perhaps that is a trend that might be on the rise into the future yes, nice. because we are short, we have a deficit nice. in our residential. And thank you very much. I think there was a question around whether we, the real estate sector is getting enough support from government. I think from a tax base, from an interest rate basis, yes, but not from all the various relief funds, not sufficiently because real estate is not even uh, in the drop box when you go and make an application, you know, so it hasn't been sufficient. But I think no amount of government support would have been enough. Uh, what we do need is for this situation to turn around and we need to move on to the next stage of, of lockdown as quickly as we can. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nkuli. Thank you. And then last but not least, Simon, if you could maybe just wrap up and... Uh... Okay, I'll be quick, Neil. Thank you very much. Uh, look, essentially, from a legal perspective, um, we are all in a place of, and also an emotional and psychological perspective, we're in a place of vulnerability, in a place of, of fear. And I think the natural psychology is that uh, when you feel that way, you end up um, retreating and not engaging each other. So I encourage from sort of a legal perspective, especially landlords and tenants, to open up, keep open the communication channels, engage each other. The world needs to uh, move away from, or at least transform itself in the following way. Uh, people need to not turn away from each other. They need to turn towards each other. They need to make each other feel uh, a sense of worthiness. And I think uh, if we can achieve that, uh, we can set all, of, set all of us, each other free. And um, if we can do that, I think we can make some good progress. Wonderful. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you, the panelists, and I want to thank also you, the audience, for joining us today. We run this webinar every single week from 12 o'clock to 1, and we obviously overrun a little bit to quarter past, as we have today. So I want to thank each and every one of the panelists. First, Dr. Rula Boerter, thank you very much, economist uh, Avan Roeder, 
um, property economist and value of uh, Rudin Associates, uh, Wayne Funafin, co-founder and CEO of Coin Online, Mkuli Bukhapa, and uh, Mkuli, for, who is the managing director of Broad Property Real Estate Services, and Simon Dipinar, who is attorney of the High Court for Simon Dipinar and Associates. I want to thank you all. This the questions, the way we're going to handle questions going forward is that we will, in fact, deal with them in future webinars. Next week, I encourage you to please join us next week. We do have uh, a webinar, which is what, where to next for the residential market. So we're going to be covering different sectors and uh, prop tech, etc. going forward. So look out for that on the, the REMAG website.